Thank you, Fiona. Where are the stories of the disabled people of God? I have three little stories to tell you about my search for stories of people like me. Story one takes place about 15 years ago. It's a sunny Sunday morning and I'm looking at the notice board outside my local church, looking for Bible passages that will be read today. And I'm sure a lot of people listening know the feeling when you realise that a healing narrative is about to be preached on. Well, I go into the church anyway, because it's Sunday. Um, the story of the paralysed man lowered through the roof is read to me by a minister who says, Jesus forgave his sins first because the sin in his life was probably what led to his paralysis. And I really want to say it was probably something like falling off a horse that led to his paralysis. But I won't. Because even though I feel bad after that service, I'm pretty sure that the problem is not that minister, but me. As a child, I believed there was something fundamentally wrong with me that I just had to identify and fix, and then I would be okay. And I went to a church where people shared stories of what God had done in their lives, and they all went something like this. I was a bad person, or sick, or addicted, or disabled, or gay, or a criminal. And then Jesus, and now I'm better. And the last part was really important. And I never heard a different kind of story. Growing up, I didn't have any of the language I have now to tell my story. I didn't have words like autistic or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or disabled or bisexual or non-binary. My story was just wrong. And that must mean I needed fixing in mind, body and soul. And one day maybe I would work out what was wrong with me. And then I might find out how to be just about acceptable enough to be loved. And I lay in the dark and asked Jesus to save me from myself. So on this sunny Sunday, I'm trying really hard to get out of this church. And across the room, I see the minister spot me because I'm using a wheelchair, which in some churches is like having a flashing light above your head saying, fix me. And he comes over to talk to me. And after some friendly preamble, he says, Jesus never met a single person who was disabled, who he didn't heal. You should have hope. And I just look at him for a minute and I want to ask him, can Jesus give me hope that my disability benefits application won't be turned down for the third time? Can he give me hope that people will stop yelling insults at me on the bus? Can he give me hope that you will ramp the steps to your altar so that I can get to communion with everyone else in the church? But I say none of this. I say thank you. And then I wheel out of there as fast as I can, thanking God for power assisted workers. So and I spent a lot of time thinking about whose story that minister was telling when he talked about the paralyzed man lowered through the roof, because it wasn't a story of my people. I've been trying to find out if there are other stories you can tell about God and disabled people. But all I ever heard in church were people singing, the deaf shall hear, the lame shall dance, the blind shall see. Thank you, Jesus, but I don't want to dance. I want to hear the stories of my people. But I didn't even know where to start to look for them. Story two takes place about 10 years ago when I'm at the Greenbelt Festival and I'm camping in the interestingly named accessible camping area and a huge pipe has been put across the one path out of the accessible camping area into the rest of the festival and my wheelchair won't go over this pipe so I'm stuck on the outside of the festival and I had to find a staff member to beg for access to a Christian festival that has a great focus on social justice which I have paid for and the staff member says to me We've got a lot of things to do on site. Why should we prioritize you and your friends? And I realized two things. The first is that I can't do this anymore. Every church door is closed to me and every altar is a flight of steps away from me. And most of my experiences in churches are painful. So why am I putting myself through this Sunday after Sunday when I could choose to go for a walk in the forest or watch a superhero movie? And the second thing I realize is that I still don't know if this is just my story. Maybe I really am wrong and need fixing, or maybe out there are the stories of the disabled people of God. And maybe those stories needed finding and sharing. And I started a year long argument with God in my head about how I really wasn't qualified to find those stories. Okay, I was studying sociology, but this was research that needed to be done by a really pious person, probably a, a priest, or at least someone who actually believed in God all the time, and definitely not by someone who was wrong and needed fixing. But after about a year when I couldn't stop thinking about this, God won that argument, as God often does. And I went out to find the stories. And as Donald Eady says, that was the moment when my world cracked open and light broke through. 
I heard so many important stories of people pushed to the edges of churches that didn't know how to make space for them. And it was like a light was being shone on my own story. Like I remembered all the times I'd been prayed for as a teenager that God would heal me of the family curse that I was told was responsible for what I now call neurodivergence. And I remembered that when I first tried to speak out about my experiences, a church leader turned to me and said, Naomi, all you talk about is disability, as if telling that story was wrong. And it was really painful to hear the stories of the disabled people of God. And I ran away and joined the pagans for a while. They're wonderful people. And I found God in the forest. And it's quiet in the forest. So I could spend eight years listening. Story three is from about a year ago when I'm on a retreat. It's at a place that I know quite well, and I mostly know the rules here. Now, if you're a neurodivergent person, you'll know what it's like to spend your life knowing rules that no one ever tells you the rules. Rules like we make casual conversation in the coffee lounge, but we speak solemnly of religious things in the chapel. And at the dinner table that night, someone asks me, Naomi, what do you do? And my brain starts firing off in all directions trying to figure out the rules here. Is this a real question, or is this one of these strange fake questions that you're a typical people? sometimes ask and I don't know why. So I answer the question because this is a Christian conference and my special interest is disability in church. So I imprint up my special interest on this kind poor woman for about 10 minutes. And across from us at the other side of the table is sitting a nun. And when I start to realise how she's looking at me, I start to realise that I've been talking too much and I rush to make up for it by asking a lot of questions about the retreat centre. And I think maybe this time I've got away with it. Maybe this time my neurodivergent style of communication hasn't offended anyone. But the next day I meet that nun for spiritual direction and she tells me I need to be fixed from a sin of selfishness. Actually, I think she said healed, but I heard fixed because I'm pretty sure she was talking about my autistic style of communication. And a part of me still desperately wants to be cured and fixed and made neurotypical and never bother anyone again with my special interests and my talking too much. And as I'm on the train home from this retreat, having run away and left early, I'm thinking about how, yes, I struggle with selfishness, probably more than most people. And I need healing from that and so many things. But what if I don't need fixing? What if my tendency to info dump is a gift from God? What if my special interests are a gift from God? What if my wheelchair is a gift from God and also from the NHS? Thank you, NHS. And I'm thinking about what Reverend Tim Good says based on the line from the Psalms about how we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. Our whole selves, our disabled selves, our neurodivergent selves, selves and how this is one story of the disabled people of God. I met Tim at this conference and I've met so many people here who've told me a little piece of this bigger story. For about eight years, this conference was my church and I found God in the people of God. And slowly all of us together on the edge, we started to make one space for the disabled people of God to tell our stories. And there are more and more spaces like this now. But so many of the people I talk to are still reluctant to tell their stories. They say things like, I'm not a theologian, so I don't know if this is the right thing to say. And then they tell me an unbelievable, beautiful story. And these stories have taught me more about God and the people of God than any priest preaching about the healing narratives ever could. And the more I hear these stories of the disabled people of God, the more I can have an encounter like I did with the nun at the retreat center and come out of it still believing that maybe I don't need fixing. I am disabled and neurodivergent and bisexual and non-binary and I love stories and cats and superheroes and God looked upon me and saw that I was good. And every new story I hear of the disabled people of God makes me think and God looks upon us all and sees that we are good. And I want every one of us to have that experience, every single disabled, deaf, neurodivergent, learning, disabled and chronically ill person. So please keep telling your story. It probably won't end with you being fixed and that's why it's important. It's our stories that have shown me that we are loved exactly as we are. We each hold a precious piece of the bigger story of God and it matters. So where are the stories of my people? Thank you for listening.